Oh. This conference will now be recorded. The reason that we had this last week off is because I was actually traveling. I went to Washington State and I went on some hikes. I did Colchuck Lake, which was about nine miles. <laughs> took took us a, a long time. It took us like nine hours. Um, and then also I went to Rainier and did uh, the Skyline Loop. So I don't know if I have any fellow hikers, people who like hiking in the group. Hopefully I do. That would be exciting. Um, but anyways, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I hope everyone got to, you know, enjoy a Friday without us having to meet. Okay, guys, so today we're on week 17. And we're going to be talking about patient safety. So it's an exciting time. Oh, yes, we have some people who like to hike. Okay. Well, it's one person, but that's that's good enough for me. <laughs> um, if you guys have any recommendations, please, by all means, write them down because I will uh, be going to Colorado soon. So that's going to be exciting. All right. Let's do this thing. Okay. So let's do our examination outline. Let's see where we are. And then today we're covering Chapter 18, which is patient safety. Today should be a little bit of a... Um, of a shorter session, which is good. We don't have as many slides to cover. Um, and some of these concepts we have kind of touched base on in the past, so it should just be a little bit more of a review than anything, to be honest. So at this point, we've covered identification of infectious disease processes, surveillance and epidemiologic investigation. Um, oh, update. So hopefully, Danielle, Danielle Rankin should be able to do our statistics, uh, at least the first portion of the statistics presentation on September 9th. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, I know that we we kind of uh, skipped chapter 13, which is the statistics chapter, but she's going to be covering that chapter on September 9th. Um, so, you know, look forward to that. And I'll be sure to send out an email since it's definitely going to be somebody who uh, is extremely knowledgeable in stats and epi. Uh, she's literally a whole PhD, so <laughs> she's excellent. Uh, preventing and controlling the transmission of infectious agents and then employee and occupational health. So right now we're in the management and communication section. That's what we're focusing on. And this is what the management and communi communication section looks like. These are all the different chapters that you have to be familiar with for management and communication. And we're on week 17 right now, as you can say, which is healthcare information and information, healthcare informatics and information technology, and then chapter 18, which is patient safety. So today we are gonna be covering uh, chapter 18, patient safety. Okay, patient safety, here we go. So patient safety, currently between five and 10% of patients admitted to acute care hospitals acquire one or more infections, representing the most common adverse event affecting approximately 2 million patients each year in the United States. It is estimated that 75,000 deaths and an estimated 33 billion per year reflect the healthcare burden of these complications. These data demonstrate the critical link between infection prevention and control and improving patient safety. So, depending on which facility you're at or which organization you're with, infection prevention can fall basically under different buckets or um, be, essentially be linked to different departments. So for us, our department is under patient safety at the organization that I'm with now. Um, that's just the way that infection prevention gets bucketed. It's under the patient safety umbrella. Other places have their own departments, their own infection control departments. Others are linked in with quality. So like quality, management, patient safety, all of those together. Clinical outcomes is another um, is another bucket where you can essentially have infection prevention be a part of that team or of that department. So there, there are a lot of different areas where infection prevention kind of fits in when it comes to healthcare. And the important thing is that we recognize how important the role of infection prevention is, is to patient safety. And I think and I think at times, you know, we may feel like, oh well, you know, we're we're doing surveillance or depending on the way that you're facility is set up. You know, some people, I've I've been to some hospitals where infection prevention is uh, very surveillance heavy and like computer heavy uh, and you don't get to spend 
you know, a lot of time out on the floors. You don't get to communicate, you know, with staff as much. But I've also seen other programs where it's a much, it's a much better mix of the two where you do get to do surveillance as well as be out present on the floors, rounding, looking at your central lines, your foleys, your vents, uh, your different departments, rounding on, you know, your pharmacies, et cetera. And, and I mean, personally for me, I, f I feel like that's, that's the best mix um, of, of being able to experience that rounding and, and being a part of that healthcare team. So understanding how important infection prevention is to patient safety is, is obviously one of the biggest things that we need to understand as IPs. All right, the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. When you take the time to read over your patient safety chapter, one of the things that you're going to notice is that they very heavily, very, very heavily discuss certain concepts. One of those being culpability, um, punitive, like punitive actions against team members, and that blame and shame culture. It's very concerning. Some of the things that we've been seeing recently um, on the news regarding patient safety, medication errors, um, it, it's extremely concerning you know, seeing some of the things that we're seeing and the levels of which people are choosing to prosecute uh, healthcare team members, it's it's concerning because when you get into this, you know, when you, when you really start learning about patient safety, when you start learning about human factors engineering, when you start learning about human errors, you understand how important it is to ensure that people have the courage to report these mistakes and these problems. Reporting of errors, reporting of medical errors, reporting of mistakes is extremely important to ensure that our patients are safe. If your healthcare team is afraid to report the mistakes or the issues that they've done, it doesn't lead to actual resolution of those problems or those or the issues that led to that mistake. And so, you know, it's I've I've gotten into some very interesting conversations, especially with people outside of the healthcare field that, you know, feel that prosecution is necessary and you know all of these all of these very different um thoughts and um ideas, but we have to base our knowledge off of what literature says and off of what we know actually leads to better outcomes for our patients. So please keep that in mind. Um, as an infection preventionist, some of the departments that you need to make sure you have very strong connections with and very strong working relationships with is going to obviously be your clinical outcomes department, your patient safety, quality management, and risk management. So you have to make sure that you know the people responsible for that within your facility and that you have the ability of communicating with them because there are going to be times when you're going to be getting pulled um, into situations, issues where things are going to be reported. Um, and my biggest thing is to always just respond with compassion. Responding with compassion is extremely important. Um, you know, I've been approached by staff who have made mistakes and, you know, sometimes even something as simple as letting them know, hey, we actually have a policy or we have an SOP, we have a standard operating procedure, we have this document that was created for when this type of mistake occurs is because other people have also made this mistake. So it's not just you. Um, and and that, that alone provides people a lot of relief. So keep that in mind. All right, so some key concepts. Patient safety science draws methods from high-risk industries such as aviation and nuclear power. Blending evidence-based epidemiologic strategies and clinical knowledge with the human capital will contribute to an organization's culture of safety. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, evidence-based epi strategies and clinical knowledge go hand in hand to, to really having good outcomes and promoting a culture of safety. Enhancing surveillance for patient safety events, including a non-punitive response to patient safety event reporting is essential for the detection of near miss and precursor safety events. So this is a very important bullet point because we have to remember that in order to have better patient outcomes, 
people need to report near misses, okay? I almost made this mistake. This almost happened. Well, what led to it? What were the issues? What are the problems? What What is, like, let's break this down piece by piece, bit by bit, and find out how we can resolve this so that our other team members are not getting into these um, into these problems. Uh, we recently transitioned to a new electronic med medical record system. And, you know, one of the things that was causing quite a bit of anxiety is that when you transition from one medical record system to another, there are communication issues with um, your machines, more specifically your Pixis. So it's it's one of your medication delivery methods, you know, and we had to have there was there was quite a lot of bit of overwriting and that was that was causing a lot of anxiety for team members because um as you guys know, there there have been um, there has there was recently a case out of Vanderbilt um, that that it included a very similar scenario, scenario with the overriding of medication, administration of the incorrect med, um, and so it's it's extremely important that any near miss is reported because we need to get down to the bottom of it and figure out how how this happened and how we can prevent it from happening in the future. The infection preventionist is an integral part of quality initiatives and becoming familiar with patient safety language will help facilitate interventions as infection preventionists partner with a variety of disciplines and colleagues on designing safe, reliable systems to support infection prevention and control. And it's not just supporting infection prevention and control, it's also supporting patient safety, it's also supporting clinical outcomes. So being knowledgeable about the terminology, being knowledgeable about um, the different the different metrics that your that your nearby departments, like I said, what is risk management looking at? What is um, patient safety and high reliability reliability looking at? What type of metrics are we looking at? We're looking at falls. We're looking at um, medication scanning. We're looking at med admin errors. Everything that that they're looking at is something that you should be familiar with. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be an expert in all aspects of patient safety and um, you know quality promotion it's okay to not be a full-blown expert but you do have to be familiar and you do have to at minimum realize who those partners are within your facility all right so to err is human so the institute of medicine defines medical errors as the failure of a planned action to be completed as intended or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim the committee the committee on the quality of health care in america was established in 1998 by the institute of medicine and its first report to err is human estimated that between 44,000 and 98,000 Americans die each year as a result of medical mistakes with an associated cost of 17 to 29 billion. So this is a very important, um, this is a very important piece of literature um, that really highlighted a lot of the issues that we had, um, that we have, okay, we, things are improving, but we still have a lot of problems within, um, within healthcare. And most recently I watched this, you know, as I was, I, so I try to make sure that I review my content and, and look and try to learn what I can for our for our group meetings. And so I, I watched this interview um, to Ur is Human, 20 Years of Healthcare Quality. And it was um, on the JAMA Network on YouTube. It's not very long, it's a 33 minute long interview, but I, I really, really enjoyed listening to this interview. And, um, you know, they were talking about the history of To Err is Human, how, you know, when they were putting it together, looking at all of the, the, the literature that was available at the time, lack thereof, and um, the fact that their their work was actually leaked. So I I did not I didn't know that I didn't know that you know it had been leaked initially, which is why they had to speed up and ramp up, and and try to get you know the final document released earlier. And so this is definitely an interview that I recommend. They touch on a lot of very important things. Um, they also touch on uh, the importance of integrating public health into our healthcare systems and paying more attention to some of our ambulatory care because we have had so much um, pressure, I don't know, it's not, I guess, pressure, yes, but so much attention has fallen on our acute care facilities um, our nursing homes, you know, with CMS, with all of these different uh, rules of participation, with all of these different, you know, 
guidelines that have come out, there's a big focus on acute care. And I really liked how, you know, they mentioned the importance of bringing in public health, focusing on those social determinants of health, and also how we need to have a larger emphasis on ambulatory care. Because let me tell you something, ambulatory care is wild out there. It is wild out there. I don't know when was the last time you visited an ambulatory site. For me, it was personally this year. And let me tell you, some of the things I saw, I can't, cannot unsee. Okay, so most common adverse errors. So what are going to be some of our most common adverse errors? Medication and transfusion errors. Infections, yes. Yes, we know infections, obviously infection prevention. Complications of surgery, including our wrong site surgery, which absolutely does happen. Suicide, restraint-related injuries, falls, burns, pressure ulcers, misidentification, and then the wrong diagnosis or treatment. So, yeah, yes, absolutely. These are all common errors that we see within healthcare, um, which is why some of this stuff is tracked so closely um, and has such tight metrics centered around them, you know, like your falls, your burns, your your pressure ulcers. We have um, we have this thing called happy rounds for our, you know, our healthcare associated pressure injuries, making sure that we're 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 rounding on those patients, taking a look at those potential pressure points. There's lots of um, intervention and, and initiatives that are centered around all of this. So the Department of Health, so underlying causes of medical errors. So what, what are some of those underlying causes of medical errors? The Department of Health and Human Services Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality summarizes the underlying cause of medical errors to be related to communication problems. So this is a list of all of the different things that um, are attributing or causing or, you know, our underlying causes of medical errors. But a really massive reason is going to be those communication problems. When you have communication problems, um, it can lead to misunderstandings on medications that have been prescribed. It can lead to, you know, it can lead to so many issues. And so having very clear communication is extremely important within the healthcare teams. Inadequate information flow, human problems, patient related issues, organizational transfer of knowledge, oof, six, staffing patterns and workflow. This has been a huge, huge pressure point during the pandemic, right? So the amount of, I, it just, it's, I mean, I'm just flabbergasted and just thinking about it, but the amount of, well, you know, seasoned, nurses that we've lost is just it's tremendous um, and when you lose that amount of knowledge and the amount of that amount of staff who are familiar with your guidelines your recommendations your culture your process and you're bringing in new graduate nurses trying to you know make sure that they're getting the information that they need the education that they need but then you also have that mix of travelers who may not be as familiar with your systems your policies your procedures all of these staffing patterns and workflow issues can result in um, in a lot of issues, essentially medical errors, technical failures, and inadequate policies and procedures. All right, financial costs of medical errors. Okay, AHRQ estimates that medical errors cost a large hospital about five million per year and a total of 17 to 29 billion per year in the United States. Potentially preventable medical errors that occur during or after surgery alone may cost employers nearly 1.5 billion per year, according to the new estimates by AHRQ. A reduction in medical errors could result in large cost savings for healthcare organizations as well as for purchase purchasers and insurers, and the ability to articulate a compelling business case for the avoidance of these adverse events may prompt system-wide investments in infection prevention and patient safety. I think that this is one of the areas that um, 
a lot of infection preventionists struggle with when they're trying to make a business case for additional staffing. And the, and the thing is that our department does not function the way a lot of other departments within the hospital do. You know, for surgery, you have your patients coming in for procedures, your surgeons, you're being able to, you know, you've got that, all of that money is flowing in. You, for the emergency department, your visits, hospital admissions, procedures, endo, you know, endoscopy procedures for ambulatory surgery centers, et cetera. All, you've got all of these procedures and there's a lot of, you can, you can very easily, like with a budget, go over and be like, oh, okay, well, this is, this is what your specific department, what your specific area, what your specific service line is contributing um, to our facility. With infection prevention, it can be it's a bit more difficult to make that business case because we have to pull from a lot of different areas. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest things is that we don't have standardized numbers for um, verifying Microsoft Outlook. What are you talking about? Um, we, we don't have a lot of you know standardized measures for this is this is how much we can really truly estimate for a clavsy to be a caudi to be we have general numbers and those numbers vary like when you really start to do a deep dive into into what, what the numbers are and what what we can really you know um you, you basically have to pick make your make your best educated decision based on the papers and the data that they used but trying to find a way to motivate our executives to invest into infection prevention is extremely important and definitely looking at um, the cost of those collapses, those CAUDIs, those SSI, SSIs, all of these prevention efforts do lead to better outcomes for our patients. All right, sentinel events. Okay, sentinel events. These are very important. Um, I can almost guarantee that you'll have a question on sentinel events and it may be, you know, what type of um, they could give you an, like various examples and be like, which of the following would you consider a sentinel event? But I, I very strongly feel that they want to make sure that as an infection preventionist, you are aware of what a sentinel event is. So please, 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 please make sure that you are very comfortable and familiar with this definition. It is an important definition. It is an important definition and it's, it's extremely important to be aware of. Wait a minute, what happened? Oh, I see. Okay, that should be better. I'm sorry, I was hearing an echo. Okay. All right, so between 1995 and 2012, 6,994 sentinel, sentinel events have been reported to the Joint Commission. 59.9% percent of which resulted in patient deaths. A sentinel event is an unexpected occurrence involving death or serious, this is, this is it right here, this is the definition that you need to know. A sentinel event is an unexpected occurrence involving death or serious physical or psychological injury or the risk thereof. Serious injury specifically includes loss of limb or function. The phrase or the risk thereof includes any process variation for which a recurrence would carry a significant chance of a serious adverse outcome. Yeah, I don't know if we have a Sorry, somebody did not mute themselves. Um, such events are called sentinel because they signal the need for immediate investigation and response. The terms sentinel event and error are not synonymous. Not all sentinel events occur because of an error and not all errors result in sentinel events. Okay, let's do a quick concept check. So, please just stop. <laughs> What is the most common method of evaluating major incidents, sentinel events, and medical errors? A, a SWOT analysis. B, a root cause analysis. C, a statistical process control. Or D, a PDSA.
All right, very solid. Great work. You guys all got it right. Yes, it's going to be a root cause analysis. So for our Sentinel events, the the you know you have to associate your root cause analysis with your Sentinel events. Okay. Um. And we've we've covered a root cause analysis in the past, but just as a reminder, um, you can also the other ob okay other optional choices that they could have put in here is like a fishbone diagram or an Ishikawa diagram. Okay, so um, root cause analysis indeed. All right, let's do some true or false questions. Okay, habituation to an alarm or alarm fatigue was recently identified as a sentinel event alert from the Joint Commission. Is this true or false? Okay, I've got two answers. I, let me get at least two more. <laughs> Because one is false and one is true. So let's see. Okay. Okay. Very good for those of you who put true. Yes. Habituation to an alarm or alarm fatigue was recently identified as a sentinel alert from the Joint Commission. Um, and it's very easy. It's easy, easily understood why this um, has been identified as a sentinel event because alarm fatigue is very much real. So um, I remember when I was talking to one of my colleagues when we were out on a trip, and I was like, "Yeah, well, you know, the PP fatigue is very real, and it's it's, it's difficult to motivate staff to make sure that they're wearing the the right PPE. They've just gotten a bit complacent throughout the pandemic." And I remember he was like. PPE fatigue he's like that's not real like that's not a real thing and I'm like no it is, it is a real thing I'm telling you personal protective equipment fatigue is very much real um, and uh, so is these alarm fatigues I mean it's just when you walk onto a unit you literally have you're you're overwhelmed by just the tremendous amount of noise that our nurses and our healthcare team has to pay attention to. You can have ventilators firing off for a multitude of re reasons, pumps that are also going off. You've got your monitors, I mean, literally all sorts of reasons. Um, your alarms, right, for fall risks, just that's that's a portion of it right so you have all of that in the background and then on top of that you then have to log into a medical record system that at times has alerts for literally everything under the sun that i'm like i don't even know if i remember the other day like a box popped up on a chart and i hit accept and i was like wait how do i go back i don't know what i just accepted right and that's and that's me that's me with not like a bajillion type of tasks that I need to take care of. So yes, alarm fatigue is very much a big issue because it could be very easy to miss. Serious alerts, um, critical lab values, all sorts of stuff. So yes, 100%. All right, next one. Each year in the United States, 7% of hospitalized patients develop an HAI. Is this true or false? Each year in the United States, 7% of hospitalized patients develop a healthcare associated infection. Okay, so we've got quite a bit of false. People think it's higher. It's actually a bit lower. Um, it's a bit lower. It's right around 4%. They're not going to ask you specifically the percentages. I mean, at least I don't think they are, but it's good to just be familiar of the overall figures. All right, the Joint Commission defines Sentinel events and requires accredited facilities to complete a thorough and credible root cause analysis and action plan within 45 calendar days of becoming aware of the event. True or false?
Excellent. Yes, for all of you, those of you who put true. Absolutely, 100%. All right, so the patient safety event taxonomy. So the patient safety event, event taxonomy developed by the Joint Commission with the assistance of representatives of provider and health profession, professional organizations and the federal government contains five complementary root nodes or primary classifications. Okay, so um, I have found that they often just like for you to be familiar with different quality concepts and um, to just kind of be aware of them. I, I don't feel that a lot of their questions are extremely, extremely detailed, but they at least want you to know the basics. Okay, so for the patient safety event taxonomy, we've got impact, which is the outcomes or effects of medical errors and systems failure, commonly referred to as harm to the patient. The type, which is the implied or visible process that were faulty or failed. The domain, which is the characteristics of the setting in which an incident occurred and the type of individuals involved. The cause, which are the factors and agents that led to an incident. And then prevention and mitigation, which are the measures taken or proposed to reduce the incident and effects of adverse occurrences. All right, Deficit Reduction Act of 2005. So this requires the identification of conditions that are high cost or high volume or both that result in the assignment of a case to a diagnosis related group, your DRGs. The um, diagnosis related groups and DRGs, it's a very common term that is used by a, a lot of our nursing, um, a lot of our nursing teams, just um, what type of categories patients are falling into. It's, it's, it's something that's important for you to be aware of as an infection preventionist so that you can at minimum understand the language that everyone is speaking in a room around you, okay? Those diagnosis related groups are important. That has a higher payment when present as a secondary diagnosis and then could reasonably have been prevented through the application of evidence-based guidelines. Therefore, for discharges occurring on or after after October 1st of 2008, hospitals do not receive additional payment for cases in which one of the selected conditions was not present on admission. All right, and now we're going into our hospital acquired conditions. So according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, hospital acquired conditions are conditions CMS deems to be reasonably preventable with the implementation of evidence-based guidelines. Beginning July of 2008, CMS included 10 conditions that were selected for the um, hack payment regulations. Of note, three of these 10 hacks are directly related to infection prevention and control efforts. So what are the three healthcare or hospital acquired conditions that tie into infection prevention when it comes to CMS? What are the three? Ooh, interesting. Okay. So I've got caudi clavsi C. diff, SSIs, caudis and clavsies, clavsies, caudis, SSIs. Mm, somebody thinks it's caudi clavsies and pressure injuries. Very interesting. So it, it's it's interesting because they're is quite a bit that's in here. The three that are specifically related to infection prevention are going to be seven, eight, and nine. So catheter-associated urinary tract infections, vascular catheter-associated infections, and surgical site infections, okay? But for those of you who put like pressure injuries, um, falls, all of that other stuff, it's still part of those 10 hospital-acquired conditions, those 10 hacks, but they don't specifically fall under infection prevention, right? So like falls, traumas, pressure ulcers, blood incompatibilities, like this is things that they are still looking for, those DVTs, PEs, all things that they're looking for, but the three that fall under infection prevention specifically are CAUTIs, CLAPSIs, and SSIs. All right, a culture of safety. Organizational culture can be described as the set of values, guiding beliefs, or ways of thinking that are shared among members of an organization. It is the feel of an organization that is quickly picked up by new members. Culture is the way we do things around here. Culture is extremely, extremely important when it comes to 
the safety of your team members and the safety of your patients, um, ensuring that your units have a, like, you'll notice this, like, if, even when you have a hospital that's under one general umbrella, like one general healthcare system, you will still you will still see differences between your units. Some units have um, some units are just more cohesive, um, compassionate with each other, respectful, very team oriented, and a lot of that has to do with the individual leadership on those units um, and that camaraderie that they build within the unit. And so having a culture of safety obviously is impacted by the organization that you work for, but even at a more local level, like even within your own units, by those unit leaders, by your unit manager, your assistant nurse managers, they can have a huge impact um, on, on the safety of your staff and of the patients, right? The patient safety literature is filled with recommendations for organizational leaders to become system thinkers and to eliminate the blame and shame mentality of the past, 100%. A culture of safety must prevent punitive reactions to mistakes and staff members must feel confident that if they speak out about risk, their leaders will respond. Extremely, extremely important. I did, um, through Avon Health, we have this training that's called the Patient Safety Academy, which is a week-long training all focused on patient safety. And one of the assignments for this academy was to go out into one of the units and to ask team members on that unit, where do you think the next major uh, patient safety risk will stem from, like specifically in this unit? Um, and it was very interesting because a lot of the responses that I got for the unit I visited were centered around um, knowledge, like access to education on different, you know, different issues like, oh, well, I think that we need more training on a CRRT, you know, the training that we currently, like things like that and listening to your team, listening to your frontline team members and trying to solve those problems before they become a huge patient safety uh, risk. I just, I can't highlight the importance of that, of, of being familiar with that. All right, our patient safety culture evolves with a pathological culture where why waste our time on safety? <laughs> with the reactive, we do something when we have an incident. And I think, I think a lot of infection prevention programs are in this reactive bubble and not by choice, not by choice, but because of staffing, like they don't have enough staffing to truly be bureaucratic or proactive, right? With bureaucratic, we have systems in place to manage all identified risk. With proactive, we are always on the alert for the risk that might emerge. And then with generative, risk management is an integral part of everything that we do. So um, just know that you can ebb and flow, depending on what's going on, the situation, staffing, et cetera, knowledge of the team members that you have, that's all important. Uh, a strong safety culture. So a healthcare setting with a strong safety culture has been described as generative, generative, <laughs> uneasy about risk, constantly seeking out best practices, always looking for where the next mistake is going to happen, and then working to prevent it, right? So I think asking that question, when do you think, where do you think the next major patient safety uh, risk is going to come from related to your unit, to this department? Getting those, those answers from those team members, I think people want to do the right thing. And um, I got some very great and honest answers. A safety culture fosters a learning organization where staff members share information about mistakes and errors in order to prevent them from recurring. And this is why we keep mentioning the importance of avoiding culpability, punitive actions, and sh blame and shame. If you don't share, if people do not have the courage to share their near misses, the mistakes that they've made, we cannot protect other staff members or our patients. It's, it's just, it's not possible. If you're terrified that you're going to lose your job because you made a mistake, other people can then make that mistake that can result in serious patient harm. So we have to, we have to allow staff to come to us and, and let us know when these mistakes happen. This type of organization emphasizes reciprocal accountability, meaning that everyone holds each other accountable for patient safety. It's not just, it's not just dialysis. It's not just 
uh, respiratory, it, it's all of us together. We have reciprocal accountability. Okay, so the five tools. This is a little bit of a long one, but we do have to understand um, some of our human factors engineering. So just, you can just listen to this one. <laughs> okay, so the five tools. Human factors engineering involves research in human psychological, social, physical, and biological characteristics, and is concerned with the design of tools, machines, and systems that take into account human capabilities, limitations, and characteristics characteristics. The goal is to create designs that are safe, comfortable, and effective for humans to use. Human factors analysis is the systematic study of elements involving a human-machine interface with the intent of improving working conditions or operations. Ergonomics is the science of studying people at work, then designing tasks, jobs, information, tools, equipment, facilities, and the working environment so that people can be safe, effective, productive and comfortable. In the highly complex healthcare environment, understanding how humans interface with technology and equipment is crucial to understanding and preventing errors. Error wisdom recognizes that complex, high technology systems are subject to rare, but usually catastrophic organizational accidents in which a variety of contributing factors combine to breach the many safeguards and that some organizational accidents sequences could be thwarted at the last minute if those on the front line had acquired some degree of mindfulness about failure points. And so that reminds me a lot of the Swiss cheese model, right? That's what they're talking about. They're saying we run, we can have all of these complex issues, especially when we're working with high tech technology systems, and we should have all of these barriers set in place to ensure that we prevent these mistakes from happening. And so here we have that Swiss cheese model where it's like, and this one is this one is talking about pandemic defense, right? This is just generic. Um, but you have physical distances, staying home if you're sick, mask, hand hygiene and cough etiquette, avoiding touching your face, like all of these little, when all of these little holes line up, that is when you have an error. And that's what they're talking about with this human factors engineering engineering piece and those five tools. Reliability science is the study of a process to achieve failure-free operation over time to reduce process defects and improve system safety. And then resiliency is the intrinsic ability of a system to adjust and sustain operations during periods of stress or after an event, which we have we have all been through some very serious periods of stress. All right, our human limitations. So human factor limitations that contribute to errors include limited memory capacity, which is five to seven pieces of information are typical for short-term memory. Five to seven pieces of information are typical for short-term memory. If you have five to six patients, what does that mean? You can remember maybe about one thing per patient, right? Like there is so much, so much that our teams have to remember. It's just, it's insane. Um, it's, it's bananas. So yes, limited memory capacity is one of them. Negative effects of stress and associated cognitive tunnel vision used to compensate and focus in highly intense situations. Absolutely. Negative influence of fatigue and sensory overload, right? I mean, we all have those days when we just don't feel like we're functioning at 100%. Um, and, and that happens to our frontline team members as well, where they have those days where maybe they, maybe stuff is going on at home and they couldn't get rest. And so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of human limitations to the work that we do. Overdependence on multitasking skills of staff in complex work environments. All right, the second victim. In 2000, Dr. Albert Wu described healthcare personnel involved in an unanticipated adverse event as the second victim. These involved providers may feel personally responsible for the unexpected outcome and believe they failed the patient and may demonstrate doubts in their clinical skills and knowledge base. The healthcare personnel involved in a medical error want a system assessment, the support of colleagues, a sense of shared responsibility for the error, obviously with, you know, with your leadership, 
a preventative action plan, a commitment to fix system problems, and often psychological counseling. And so this is very important, um, understanding how medical errors don't just affect our patients, but how they can actually have a huge impact on our healthcare providers um, and our healthcare personnel. All right, let's do a question. Blank is a systematic, proactive method for evaluating a process to identify where and how it might fail and to assess the relative impact of different failures in order to identify the parts of the process that are most in need of change. A is going to be a PDSA, which is a Plan, Do, Study, Act. B will be a root cause analysis. C will be a failure mode affect analysis. And D is DMAIC. Okay, very good. So everyone put C. Um, yes, it's gonna be our failure mode effect analysis. It's really important because the failure mode effect analysis really falls into this category of a proactive me method. So we're trying to be proactive about the issue and we're trying to figure out, okay, well, where might this system fail? right? You're trying to prevent it from happening. The problem has not yet happened. The failure has not yet happened. That's where the failure mode effect analysis comes in. All right, now let's do some matching. So your answer choices are going to be up at the top. You've got your expert, your delegator, your demonstrator, your formal authority, and then your facilitator. Okay, so those are your different options for the bottom part. All right, so the first one is IPs use their vast knowledge base to inform learners and challenge them to be well prepared. This can be intimidating to the learner. So does that first one describe an expert, a delegator, a demonstrator, a formal authority, or a facilitator? Okay, we've got somebody said facilitator. Okay, it's expert. All right, let's try the next one. This style puts the IP in control of the learner's knowledge acquisition. The IP is not concerned with learner-educator relationships, but rather focuses on the content to be delivered. That's gonna be formal authority. All right, next one. The infection preventionist coaches, demonstrates, and encourages a more active learning style. <laughs> yeah, that's the demonstrator. Okay, next one. Learner-centered active learning strategies are encouraged. The accountability for learning is placed on the learner. So learner-centered active learning strategies are encouraged. The accountability for lear learning is placed on the learner. Very good for those of you who put facilitator. And then the very last one is going to be delegator. The IP role is that of a consultant, and the learners are encouraged to direct the entire learning project. All right. Oh, that was the rationale for the FM the failure mode effect analysis. All right, guys, well, we're done. This Friday is over, so we just uh, covered patient safety. I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your weekends, and um, we will do some more learning next week. So I just hope you all are ready for more learning, more content every Friday. <laughs> All right, guys, have a good weekend. And for those of you who are testing this weekend, good luck. Or who are testing soon, good luck. And good luck studying. <laughs>